this is going to be a master class. So yeah. um, without further ado, uh, tonight we've got uh, John Storick and Dr. Peter D'Antonio from the Walter Storick Design Group. They are not going to present a basic one-on-one -on -one overview of cool rooms. We uh, Last year, we had a, a lower level presentation that also included the importance of things like getting the vibe right for the creativity. Uh, they're going to take it up a notch tonight. So if you're like me and you don't speak math, but you really appreciate the outcomes of it, uh, hang on, strap in. Uh, we're going to learn something. Uh, these are two gentlemen who have forgotten more than I will probably know on the subject. And I'm going to let us let them walk us through some of the uh, the science and tools that they are currently using, as well as some great case studies. So uh, without further ado, uh, John Storick and Dr. Peter D'Antonio, I will let you introduce yourselves and feel free to take over and share screens. Uh, in addition to chat, I'll be monitoring QA remotely. Uh, and uh, we will queue up questions uh, either as they appropriately fit in and or at the end for Q&A. So, uh, John, uh, Dr. Uh, D'Antonio, take it away. Terrific. Hey, nice to be here. Well, quite a quite an international crowd. Just uh, one of the one of the nice benefits of zooming. Although I do miss the live uh, meetings. Um, so we're going to use this as a um, and thank you, Greg, for for inviting us. Um, we're going to use this as an excuse. Um, really to show you uh, one new, very specific development that Peter and I and uh, three or four other acousticians have been working on for the last two years. Um, we we'll use typical PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to start, and at a certain point, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Peter, and there might be a little pause there while we just shift computers. Um, let me share my screen. I think I can. There we go. Okay, how does that look, Greg? Is that working? That looks beautiful. I yep. see the okay. animation as the. Um... Well, we'll describe what that animation is a little bit later. Okay, so just to be clear, this is our goal. I don't think anybody has any argument about it. Um, we're uh, and and if we've ever been in an era where it's more important to have rooms being neutral with some sort of industry, agreed to industry standard, we're in that era. Uh, it struck me over the last few years that when the Grammy is awarded for best song or best producer or best soundtrack, 15 people get up on the stage and you look at the credits on records and they're made in 15 different studios. Um, so we clearly we're in an era where it's never been more important to this kind of neutrality and this kind of standardization, or at least some sort of an agreement to standardization to take place. Um, I think we've all been chasing this forever, but it's never been more important. Um, so we've come a long way. Um, I always like to start with this slide because if you don't have recording equipment, then you don't have recording studios. And of course, what's most interesting here are the dates. It's a relatively new phenomena. Um, Let's look at a studio in the 1950s. Pretty boring, uh, architecturally uninteresting, uh, a big boundary between engineers and produce and, and artists. Uh, maybe there's an odd piece of vintage equipment here we'd like to hold on to, but basically the room really needed to not sound much better than the delivery system that it was um, that that existed at the time. We move into the 60s. My premise has always been that artists have pushed the technology. I think the technologists would take a, a, the, the inverse position. It's prob they're probably both true. Great artists. I think mediocre rooms that became great, <coughs> rooms that became greater. Um, we all recognize this picture. And we enter an era over the last 20 years where we have hundreds and literally thousands of amazing rooms. They're architecturally extraordinary. Uh, and and um, continue to get more and more accurate, but we still have issues and we still have problems. Um, tonight, we want to share with you something that Peter and I have been working on for the last few years, 
Um, our paths have crossed uh, for, for almost 40 years. Um, tell you a little bit about myself, and then of course, I'll let Peter do the same. Probably don't need too much of an introduction. Um, my career starts with Electric Lady Studios, so a little career tip, make your first studio famous. Um, and it just means that I'm that old. It was a kind of a serendipitous moment for me as a young architect, uh, getting an opportunity to do a club for Jimmy and the club becomes a studio. And even though I reminded them I'd never been in a studio, they gave me an opportunity to sort of learn as much as I could about studios, which I did by quitting my architecture job. And the studio got built. Here's a sort of younger version of me, almost over 50 years ago, original drawings for Electric Lady, still uh, a thriving studio um, in New York. And many, in fact, most of the walls from that studio are still there. Um, original entrance, which is not there anymore. Eddie Kramer changed my life. This is a picture of he and I before this iconic front was taken down. Um, and little did I know that I was actually making a project studio. Um, it may be one of the first project studios. Of course, now it's a commercial studio. Um, I, at the time, had no idea that there was a dis that there should be some distinguishing notion between project studios and commercial studios, studios with vibes, studios with great acoustics. It took me 25 years before I finally was able to make a measurement to figure out why this room works. Um, it's not the river under the under the wood floor. It's not Jimmy's vibe in the wall, although all those things might be true. It's actually a membrane resonator in the ceiling, which was sort of mostly by accident, a little bit of research. Um, and we'll talk quite a bit uh, about resonators a little bit later. That's actually what's working in this studio today. And nothing has really changed, as you'll see. Jimmy didn't last too long. That's a real tragedy. Uh, Stevie moved in, so sort of like one genius left and another stayed. And another lifetime friend, Bobby Margoloff, with his synthesizer, changed the course of music right there at that studio. Um, this photo sort of shows you the studio from 52 years ago and the studio maybe about a year or two ago. Basically, not really any different. Um, just to make sure we're all on the same page um, and, and that we're all uh, in agreement about studios, I figured a little bit of eye candy wouldn't wouldn't be a, a bad way to just set the tone for what uh, Peter is going to present uh, a somewhat scientific presentation about a new tool that we've been developing. And these are some of the projects that we've been working on. This is in LA. This is Sony's new studio. Um, Carter Burwell, the great film composer on his beach studio out in Montauk. And you can see his screen gets tucked away here and then comes down when he needs to work, kind of a nice solution. Um, I won't go over these. These are just to sort of get us in the mood. But one, you'll notice that most of these studios are large. OK. Um, this is one of my favorite. People ask me all the time, do you have a favorite studio? I usually shy away from that question, or I'll say something like the studio I'm working on. But this is indeed one of my favorite studios. We put an Airstream in the second floor of a building. and this is designed to teach 12 year old girls at the Lower East Side Girls Club how to be radio announcers inside an old Airstream. Um, an early immersive studio, Bobby Margoloff's Mikasa studio, literally in his house, thus the name, okay? To VSL studio in Vienna, again, another immersive um, uh, large control room. Um, we've had some really interesting moments. We have. We've been able to put monitors in glass, um, which has been a very interesting uh, way of getting ear level monitoring, but still being able to see 180 degrees into a studio. Um, some more examples of extraordinary uh, materialization. We'll talk a little bit more about materialization later. Um, I like this slide because the lines between Home theaters, recording studios, production rooms, dens, offices, radio stations. This is all just sort of disappearing right before our eyes. The, the traditional recording studio as we know it um, still exists, but thousands, literally thousands and thousands of hybrid studios, or as Chris Stone referred in his seminal article many years ago, satellite studios um, um, exist. So 
remains to be seen exactly what this is, but this is a recording studio and it has a demand for great acoustics. Um, I like ending on this one because this is a small room, but maybe studios will end up looking something like this or this or this, who knows? Um, one thing is for sure, the ride is not over. Anyway, towards that effort, let's return to why we're here. Um, in, an, in a research project that more or less started at, at uh, my design company, WSDG, by an intern, no less, who's now, of course, one of our partners and senior acoustician, we uh, sought to try and explore if there was a better way to more accurately predict low frequency analysis, basically low frequency uh, responses in, a, in the design mode from the Schroeder frequency and down. Peter will talk about that uh, in, in much more detail. That's how this all started. Um, at WSDG, we were using ABEC, it was probably the best tool that we had, along with intuition, along with sort of almost kindergarten level modal charts. We'll talk about why they are, we almost need to throw those out. In fact, we have thrown those out. So this started out as an intern research project, kind of took us a little bit down a black hole um, uh, when we realized that when we started to get into non-rectangular rooms of which most of our rooms are non-rectangular. Um, and, and just to be clear, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is internal room acoustics. Um, to talk about control room design or studio design would clearly take more than an hour, <laughs> obviously. <clears throat> and there are many different aspects of studio design, isolation design, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we're gonna to be specifically talking about small room acoustics which, um, to go back to my point earlier, is exactly what's going on in the world today, with thousands and thousands of studios being built, um, and they are relatively small for a wide variety of reasons. Real estate is expensive, uh, equipment has gotten smaller, actually equipment has actually gotten less expensive, um, and so the need for uh, accurate low frequency response from the shorter frequency and down is how this project all started, okay? And with that, um, this, this adventure into a predictive software package that, is, that we've now uh, somewhat, I, I guess, perfected, or we're now certainly using, we certainly have proof of concept developed. Um, we needed to form a company to do it. WSDG is not really a research company. We are practitioners. We're a design company. As you know, we have about 60 people worldwide. We design and build studios. So we formed a, a sort of research company. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to unshare my screen, allow Peter to reintroduce himself and go back. And there we go. And I'm gonna let Peter take over and sort of take us through how we got to this Niro software, which is really what we wanna talk about tonight, um, which is the main uh, effort that Ready Acoustics, our corporate entity, um, is uh, spending most of its time on, although we do have some new research projects in the, in the making. So Peter, I think you need to now take over. First step is to undo the mute so we can hear you. There you go. All right, then. let me advance. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen. I think you can easily do that. <laughs> and, um, Microsoft Office is continually reminding me to upgrade. And um, I'm going to move down. OK. <clears throat> So the first thing that, um, assuming you can see my screen and I'm going to go in presentation mode. Maybe go back up a slide and sort of introduce everybody to our, to our team. Okay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> Rinaldi is the uh, gentleman uh, John was referring to. He was an intern and I had developed a program called the Room Optimizer, which was specific for cuboid rooms. 
Um, and uh, we started to see you know, whether we could uh, <clears throat> advance that program to non cuboid rooms. And Rinaldi and I uh, began to work together. I realized that he had uh, a significant amount of uh, capability and we grew the company uh, <clears throat> uh, with, uh, founded the company with John and PK Pandy. And um, that happened in uh, roughly 2017, 18. Um, my background basically is I started up, my acoustical life began in 1983 when I founded RPG Diffuser Systems and uh, worked with that for about 34 years and I sold the company in 2017. I'm still research uh, director at uh, RPG Acoustical Systems, which is what it is called now. And, um, and in my uh, <clears throat> Forming of this company, we wanted to focus, as John said, on non cuboid rooms, which is what NERO stands for, non cuboid iterative room optimization. And, um, and these are the gentlemen that work with us, uh, all very, very competent uh, programmers and acoustical engineers. And uh, if you're interested in following uh, my research, uh, I invite you to visit my weekly educational LinkedIn page at Dr. Peter D'Antonio. And you can go to my website at peterdantonio.com. So moving right along, uh, as John mentioned, the one thing that we need to do in these rooms is to minimize acoustical distortion, what I termed acoustical distortion 30 years ago. And the forms of acoustical distortion are below 200 Hertz, our modal response, and I'll describe each of these in greater detail. Uh, the speaker boundary interference response, above 200 hertz, comb filtering, and poor diffusion. Now, these types of analyses uh, begin in the low frequencies with a, a traditional modal response prediction. And you've seen these uh, <clears throat> on the website. Uh, we're going to start with a, 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 an example of 1 to 1 1.4 to 1 1.9, which is a very popular uh, dimensional ratio. Now, one of the issues with uh, doing a dimensional ratio calculation is the fact that the, it assumes that the room is cuboid, meaning that the room is rectangular with 90 degrees angles. Uh, the boundaries are perfectly reflecting, and this is a very important point, and that is determined by a parameter called the admittance, which we, which we are denoting by Y, and the admittance is just the reciprocal of the complex impedance. <clears throat> and it also assumes that the receiver's and the listener, listeners are uh, typically in opposite diagonal corners uh, because it assumes that all the modes are excited and all the modes are heard, which is not really the case in, 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 in physical rooms. And so um, this dimensional ratio assumes a very, uh, uh, a very simple formula, which is the solution to the wave equation in which you have uh, in the numerator, you have, in that, uh, you have uh, integers, and in the denominator, you have the dimensions of the length, the width, and the height. And this is a very accurate predictor of the position of the resonances in the room. And so what we're going to compare now is uh, this prediction with a, a wave-based calculation. In this case, it's a finite element uh, calculation. And we're going to set the admittance to zero, which is uh, indicative of a perfectly reflecting uh, boundary. So you can see that uh, <clears throat> the, the positions of the resonances line up very accurately. But the, the, uh, the energy of the resonances uh, is not particularly um, in agreement with that simple prediction. And then <clears throat> what you find out is if you, um, if you introduce a an actual admittance for uh, a boundary surface, which WSDG uses routinely, which is uh, plywood, gypsum, gypsum. Uh, you see that <clears throat> uh, the peaks begin to broaden. Uh, they become even uh, less in agreement with the simple prediction. And then if you begin to make this a, an actual physical uh, room that we work in by bringing in uh, one of the loudspeakers to a typical position, you see that the agreement is even farther from 
uh, what the simple prediction is. And then if you bring the listener in uh, right here at a typical um, position in the stereo triangle, <clears throat> uh, you now see that uh, you now have introduced the, the null because the disposition is, is at the null of the width mode and, um, and the, the disagreement continues. Another, uh, <clears throat> another parameter that is not uh, considered in the simple prediction is what we call the speaker boundary interference response. And it is essentially cone filtering at very low frequencies. And you can see it in this illustration. If you have a single physical loudspeaker, <clears throat> reflections from the boundaries um, can, be sim can be simulated by these virtual sources that you see. So if you buy one speaker, you get four speakers for free, such a deal. Now, um, when all of those real and virtual sources combine at the listening position, they form a dip, a very, uh, uh, a very important and very destructive dip whose, whose depth depends upon how many boundaries are included, one, two, and, and three. And then as you move the speaker uh, into the dihedral or trihedral corner, this dip moves to higher frequencies where it is a little more easily treated with porous absorption. Um, and now we can uh, account for this SBIR in our program by windowing out the impulse response, uh, <clears throat> as you see here, to uh, include only uh, the reflections from this omnidirectional loudspeaker um, to the listening position. So that is an example of low frequency. We move on to specular reflections. Uh, specular reflections occur when the ratio of the size of a panel to the wavelength is roughly eight or greater. And the reason that is, is that when the wavelength is similar to the size of a panel, you basically get diffusion or diffraction, uniform scattering. It is only when uh, you reach this, uh, this limit that you get specular reflections. And at this frequency, a specular reflection occurs where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection, as most are familiar with. And this unfortunately causes cone filtering when this delayed reflection uh, constructively interferes with the direct sound at the listening position. And this results in cone filtering, which is called that because it looks like the teeth of a comb in a linear plot. And uh, the depth of this cone filtering depends upon the relative level between the direct sound and the, uh, and the reflection. And when they're equal, you get an infinite depth. Now we obviously need to control these specular reflections. Um, and what I'm trying to point out here is that you need a very large panel compared to the wavelength to redirect the specular reflection. And for example, if you have a three, a three foot console, the onset of a specular reflection is three kilohertz and above. A five foot window specular reflects at 1.8 kilohertz and a nine foot window specular reflects at one kilohertz. So the way to control specular reflections is number one, to reorient them with a panel that is appropriately large. And the other is to try to absorb them. And <clears throat> what's important to note um, that the absorption needs to be substantial because if the absorption <clears throat> uh, only controls uh, frequencies above three kilohertz, you see that you still have cone filtering. If you control reflections down to two kilohertz, they still exist. One kilohertz, they still exist. And they're going to continue to exist unless they are sufficiently um, uh, designed to control this low frequency notch. Then we move on to poor diffusion. So following the introduction of diffusion by RPG in 1983, diffusers have become a regular component of architectural acoustics. Specular reflections occur uh, where they redirect the sound, an absorber attenuates the sound, and a diffuser uniformly scatters the sound. And this is, a, this is an evolution of, of my research over the years to the present time that you'll hear more about. And uh, we now can measure uh, these scattering surfaces uh, with what is called a goniometer by a certain standard that we developed many years ago. 
And we have a new development where we can actually predict uh, the scattering from any shape surface from a 3D file, which is which has introduced a tremendous evolution of capability, um, which you'll be hearing more about. So here's the situation. <clears throat> These are all of the frequencies that we can perceive. And <clears throat> the low frequencies, as John mentioned, below what is called the Schroeder frequency, which is really a line of demarcation uh, between wave acoustics and geometrical acoustics. And the Schroeder frequency is related to the reverberation time and the volume of the room. Um, <clears throat> that's where wave acoustics is, prim is primarily relevant. And this is where we can also uh, control the speaker boundary interference response, which is very important. Uh, then above the Schroeder frequency is where geometrical uh, acoustics comes into play. And this is where uh, we use geometrical acoustics uh, to determine the location of the low order reflections using an image source model that I showed you uh, with respect to the SBIR. And then we use ray tracing to, to de determine the impulse response that enables us to determine the reverberation time. So moving along, uh, the challenge of what we're about to describe uh, is, is really immense when you think about it, because what you're looking at is the pressure distribution uh, at various frequencies that you see moving along for two different views uh, of the room with a cutout. And the challenge is to find a sweet spot or a, a, a location which has a, a medium or a median pressure for both the listening positions and the speakers, whether they be flush mounted, soffit mounted, uh, whether they're subwoofers. Uh, so the challenge is to find these sweet spots within the constraints of architecture and within the, the constraints uh, of aesthetics. And the way we do this is in the low frequencies by using a finite element method program, which is a wave-based program that can simulate the scattering from the room's boundaries uh, and any internal objects by solving the wave equation. Now, it requires a 2D mesh of the room's boundary, as you see here. These are triangular mesh points. You need about three of those uh, 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 per wavelength that you're trying to, for the highest wavelength that you're trying to achieve. So there's a lot of boundary elements. Um, and, <clears throat> and a 3D mesh of the interior volume of the room that you see here in this very complicated uh, illustration. And we also need to know the admittance of the boundaries and the material in the room. That is, the admittance defines the characteristics of both the boundary and the, and the material in the room. And so we developed this <clears throat> Nero program. Yeah, Peter, um, I want to just interrupt for a second. The, um, you've heard this word admittance now a few times. This, this really stumped us for a while. And I think a lot of people have underestimated the value of that, the sort of stiffness of, of the boundaries. Um, and it's a tricky value because we don't have it for a lot of boundaries. Actually, we don't have it for most boundaries. Um, Any and it's us for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, we have a, a, a potential program uh, with the National Research Council to determine uh, the admittance of boundaries in addition to just determining the, sound, the uh, STC. Anyway, so <clears throat> the way the program uh, develops is that we initially try to obtain uh, an optimal room geometry, source position, and receiver positions simultaneously uh, using a multi-objective optimization procedure. And in that process, we also monitor the number of reflections that are within the reflection-free zone that I'll be describing a little bit further. Um, and we do all of the evaluation using the finite element method. So that's an empty room. Then we move on to adding acoustical parameters, acoustical parameter equalization, which is essentially acoustical treatment. Um, the goal of, of this first step is to minimize the the notches in the impulse response, because the notches are very difficult, if not impossible to control with, uh, with equalization or treatment. And so uh, once we minimize the notches, we then attempt to uh, further minimize the, 
the, the modal excitation by applying low frequency absorption. And uh, we also uh, predict that absorption and then we measure it as I'll show you in a minute. And then we combine the geometric model and the FEM model to generate an impulse response, which we can modify with the head related transfer functions and oralize. And that's about where we are at this point in the development of the program. So we have various objective metrics that we are trying to minimize. We're trying to flatten the frequency response. Um, <clears throat> and this light blue line is, is a spatial variation um, uh, in which you have very, allow the mixing engineer to move from left to right, up and down. Uh, there's also uh, a, a mix position uh, and a producer position, which we have to uh, contend with. And the goal is to uh, essentially eliminate this dotted line and obtain as flat a response as possible within plus or minus 3 dB. We, uh, we also need to minimize reflections in the reflection-free zone. And that is the area, the temporal area, temporal domain between the direct sound and the first reflections from the rear of the room. And then we want to uh, minimize any spurious reflections that exist. So for example, here, this is the first room that I have ever measured uh, in my life, which was my living room when I was designing this. And these early reflections here come from the, from the, the, the sidewall and the floor and the ceiling. And these sparse later reflections come from reflections um, from the rest of the room. And the goal is to remove these early uh, interfering reflections and to create a linear decay, which is an exponential decay in, in a non-logarithmic uh, uh, um, plot, uh, which we have actually achieved. And we, achieve, we have achieved uh, that by using uh, uh, reflection phase grading diffusers. And we monitor in the program uh, the level of the reflections in, this, in the reflection-free zone that you see here at different frequencies uh, before and after treatment. Uh, and the goal is to optimize the level of the reflections in the reflection-free zone uh, over as broad a bandwidth as possible uh, to control that lowest bounce in the, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the cone filtering that I showed you earlier. Uh, it's, very, it's very important to use the geometry of the room and to make these surfaces as long as possible so that we can redirect those early reflections and then to add absorption, porous absorption, and sometimes resonant absorption on those surfaces to further lower the level of the specular reflections. Uh, <clears throat> we also want to have a diffuse field zone. We want to have that linear decay that I showed you. And we do that by introducing reflections uh, <clears throat> at the appropriate time and the appropriate uh, level with respect to the direct sound to enter this spaciousness zone, which is a level of research by Michael Barron many years ago and eventually uh, Dr. Floyd Toole. And then we also want to make sure that the reflections come in uh, <clears throat> at a certain level from the rear of the room in a certain direction. Uh, and this is the work of Yoichi Ando, and this is something called the inner oral cross correlation. Uh, and all of this <clears throat> Uh, happens with a very, very broadband diffuser. Uh, what you're seeing now here is a third, third generation fractal diffuser that we use. Uh, and John will point it out. Um, the largest one that we have implemented is that uh, mixed with the masters, and you'll see later. And these fractal diffusers basically cover uh, the three different uh, frequency ranges, just the way um, a multi a multi-way loudspeaker covers three different. Uh, frequency ranges. And so then the, the, <clears throat> the final goals are to control the decay, the modal decay. So if you don't control the modes, they ring. And so when you hit a bass drum, you don't hear a thud, you hear a, a very wimpy bass drum. And so we want all the frequencies to decay at the same time. We want the reverberation time, which, which can be quite uh, long in an untreated room, to be in a uh, in the roughly 3.3 to, 3 to 0.4 second range. And so how do we do this? So we use complex surface admittances with the boundaries in the acoustical treatment. We simultaneously optimize the location of the speakers and the listeners. 
and the room's vertices, which is the, essentially the geometry for any shape. Uh, we use wave-based FEM analysis for the low frequency range. We use the image source model and ray tracing to evaluate the reflection free zone and the diffuse field zone in the reverberation time. And we combine the methods uh, uh, using this multi-objective optimization, which is essentially a genetic, a very complex genetic algorithm. Uh, and we try to operate, or we do operate, within the architectural constraints and the aesthetic constraints when it comes to home theaters. Uh, we apply absorbers with specific center frequencies, peak absorption, and bandwidth, uh, which we've turned acoustical parametric equalizers uh, analogously to an electronic parametric equalizer, which has uh, these variables to damp the temple ringing. So how do we do this? Well, uh, we have three metrics. What you're seeing is what the program actually does. It, it varies the geometry of the room, and we monitor these uh, these low order reflections so that the modal response is as flat as we can get it within various constraints. Um, and we do that by, uh, by looking at this, minimizing the standard deviation, the weighted average of the standard deviation of the frequency response and the weighted uh, SBIR, the speaker boundary interference response. We do that. <clears throat> with a spatial deviation, because we want to minimize this light blue as much as possible to allow for head movement for other uh, various types of movement uh, during a, a mix. And then lastly, we want to minimize the, uh, the level of the, uh, the first and second order uh, reflections in the reflection-free zone. So Peter, just to, just to add for everybody, you might, so, someone may have, may ask, in fact, maybe that is one of the questions, how is that, what, what is the program doing as far as changing the shape? So this is really one of the first things, really one of the heart, at the heart of the, of, of the, for, of the early uh, software development that we did. We, we tell the program, and, and by the way, it's, there's no real front end on this thing. There's no GUI, which is why, of course, we're not selling the software. It's, it's actually a little, funky to put all this information in, but we have to tell this, so you have to start with something. So in, in our world, we, which comes first, an ideal shape or a programming shape from a client or, or, or a field condition? It's usually B. You have to start with, with at least some good guess of what your room should do. It solves architectural issues, code issues, programming issues, uh, size issues, volume issues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, people who are doing this, particularly at WSDG, we're, we're it, it, you know, I wouldn't say we're guessing at it since we've been doing it a long time. Um, but when that's at some moment in time, when we have at least some idea of a shape, we also have an idea of how much we can vary height, width, and length, as well as speaker geometry. That, by that, I mean listener and speaker position. So the more we can change these, the happier the program is. And of course, sometimes we can't change anything. Sometimes we're simply given a room and there is no change. There's no ability to change it, in which case we put zero in for those deltas. So in this case, you see this this is a real room, I believe, Peter, I think. I'm pretty sure it's... Uh, this is a room in, in a paper that we published. Yeah, it's, it's one of our rooms. Mm -hmm. And you see the geometry changing because the original design that we started with, we, we put into the program, okay, we can, we can make the room one foot wider. We can make the room two feet taller, or we can... Uh, and it doesn't have to be all... It doesn't all have to be raised two feet. We can move the speaker position uh, out we can change the listener position. So all these deltas go into the software and that's why you see the, the geometry uh, moving around. Sometimes the only thing we can change is the speaker position, speaker and listening position. Um, the, the idea is to get our design into the Nero process as early as possible, but we don't wanna get it in before we have some kind of client approval or some kind of customer acknowledgement that we have a scheme. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a dance and it took us a long time to kind of 
figure out how to do this. Um, uh, based on that, we now divide the program into two phases. We do the geometry first. We try to get the geometry locked in as early as possible in the design process, then allow it to go back to the design team, uh, aesthetic team, vibe team, call it whatever you want, uh, it, deal with issues like air conditioning, lighting, building codes, et cetera, et cetera. Then it goes back to the Niro team for materialization. What you're seeing here is the geometric phase being dealt with. Yeah, to, uh, to expand a little bit on that, the way we actually do it, it's called a genetic algorithm because it's right. essentially the survival of the fittest. And <laughs> so what we do with the room, the, the initial room that we start with, uh, when we make, excuse me, <clears throat> when we make the model, uh, we determine all of these vertices. And these vertices are part of the chromosome. Uh, the, the XYZ coordinate of the listening positions and the XYZ coordinates of the speakers are also uh, introduced as a chromosome. And then um, we then evaluate, we iteratively evaluate the frequency response and, um, and we look at the standard deviations. If the standard deviation is not acceptable, we go to the next level and we keep iterating until the vertices are at uh, an acceptable location, uh, all of the variables uh, in those chromosomes are um, acceptable. And that's when, we, that's when we stop the geometric analysis and move on to the-, uh, to the, the Geometry theory. is as good as it can get. Yeah. Without any materialization, it's just pure geometry. So then, uh, so now we have to improve, improve it further. And so what we do is by looking at that frequency response, we can see that, okay, we, we have a peak here at 35 Hertz, another one here, another one here. Let's design a resonator uh, to attenuate that peak. And the way we do that, uh, there is a, a mathematical method called the transfer matrix method, which we don't have time to go into, but we can actually uh, design a resonator to absorb at um, whatever this frequency that is needed. And so the prediction is the, is the blue line. And uh, we then build one of these units, as you see here. And uh, I have a large, uh, uh, <clears throat> a large impedance tube at, uh, at, in the RPG Acoustical Research Laboratory, uh, which uh, measures between 20 hertz and 200 hertz. It's, to my, best of my knowledge, the only impedance tube in the United States that uh, offers this capability. And uh, we put the prototype in there and we measure the impulse response at three, three different microphone uh, sample positions. And we calculate uh, the absorption. We actually calculate the admittance or the complex impedance, and then we convert that into the absorption for a comparison. And so uh, we have convinced ourselves that uh, this transfer matrix uh, prediction uh, over many, many, many calculations and comparisons is very, very accurate. So we are assured that we know the admittance of the acoustical materials in the room. And as uh, uh, John mentioned, we have to determine the admittance of the boundary. And we did that through trial and error, uh, which I'll talk about what, you know, as we get to a later slide here. Uh, for other measurements that we have to make, we can use the 285 cubic meter rev room uh, at, at, uh, at the Acoustical Research Center at RPG, which measures between 63 and 5,000 hertz. But this, these rev rooms only measure the absorption coefficient. They don't give you the complex impedance, which is their limitation, but uh, it's an important parameter to have. Uh, and I also have, um, if you can see behind me, um, a, another impedance tube, which is a proprietary tube that I built many years ago, which measures between um, um, this is again incorrect, measures between, um, this is wrong, this measures between 100 hertz and 5,000, this measures between 63 and 4,000, sorry about that. And we can measure um, all kinds of surfaces from absorbers, resonators, porous materials, and even fabrics. Um, so we're pretty confident about the 
uh, the admittance of the, the materials that we use in these rooms. And, and then in the final, the final analysis here, we have an untreated room, which we have done our best to, uh, to level the frequency response, to minimize the spatial deviation. Um, and um, we then by, add- By geometry, by changing, by optimizing the geometry. By geometry. And then we add uh, acoustical material within the, the constraints uh, that the architecture allows us. And we then minimize these peaks to achieve a very flat uh, frequency response. Uh, if we can get it between plus or minus uh, 3 dB, uh, depending upon um, the constraints that we uh, have to work within. And so we now have a very flat temporal decay and a very uniform reverberation time. Uh, we then combine the FEM model with the uh, geometric model and calculate an, uh, an, an impulse response that we modify with the head-related transfer functions uh, that you see here, uh, which are determined by the pinna on our heads, on our ears, and uh, we can then oralize the room. And we are now doing this. It's, um, these oralizations need to be done you know, in a very controlled environment to perceive the differences. So it's not very uh, helpful to, to, uh, to play them over a Zoom, a Zoom link. Um, and then uh, before I turn it over to John, this is a room that, uh, <clears throat> that we um, renovated at WSDG, which was a storage room, uh, <clears throat> using uh, uh, CMU walls, combination of CMU walls and gypsum plywood, gypsum boundaries. And <clears throat> we varied the admittance of the boundary surfaces until we uh, achieve an agreement uh, between the measurement and the prediction. And um, I think we were all pretty happy uh, that the agreement was as good as it was. And uh, so we have a good amount of confidence now that, um, that the program uh, is operating uh, reliably. And this was our first proof of concept. And uh, John is going to talk to you now about, and I'll stop sharing, uh, about many other rooms uh, where, which, in which we have um, <clears throat> compared the prediction and the measurement. Well, a few others we'll show you. Um, let's see a few others. Here we go. Um, let's go into presentation mode. Um, as Peter said, the first time we, we did that was in the, basically a storeroom. And um, I, I can still remember when, we, when I saw that graph, I said, I, somebody's cheating. They, we all looked at each other and said, they, they look identical, or at least, at least for us, that's pretty close. And um, that proved that our software was in fact predicting what was actually happening in the room. Um, one of the early places where we got to do this was in a small studio. Of course, we picked a ridiculously bizarre Geometry. This is uh, Rob Jasko's personal studio. Rob uh, runs the M the uh, MP uh, music production and engineering program at Berkeley, along with uh, Dan Thompson. And of course, during COVID, could not use the studios at Berkeley. So all of a sudden, his home studio, which was reasonable, uh, quite pretty, as you'll see in a second, uh, needed to become uh, much more accurate for him to do his work. And uh, this is his room. Basically, everything that you see that looks like or is a resonator, and you can see it depicted here, didn't exist. Um, quite beautiful room over his garage. And um, you can see the prediction versus the measurement. Very, very, uh, quite accurate. Um, very difficult geometry. The program really can handle any geometry. It's just a matter of how much time you want to take to 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 put it into the, the software. Um, so that was one of the early uh, examples. Uh, again, proof of concept. Um, possibly our best known one is the new studios from Mix with the Masters, which are called Rue Boyer. That's the name of the studio in Paris. And um, as you can see, very, very complex room. Um, we did have the ability to modify the geometry that we were given an existing room that had been started, but we did make some changes to it. Um, and 
on the rear wall, you see that what we believe to be the largest uh, third generation um, diffractal, mod fractal, and um, that's on the rear wall. Again, modify the geometry first as best we can. Ear level, uh, baffled monitors, pretty much no excuse for not having them. There's really, really no system that's better. If you want to eliminate SBIR or most of SBIR, that's the way to go. We've known this for a long time, so no secret there. <clears throat> and then um, the rest is treatments, about six or seven different kinds of treatments. Um, thought this would be kind of cute to show everybody. It's the first time we've, I've ever seen this. This is their console. It literally goes up and down on a lift in the middle of the room. Here it is in its test mode. Why would they do that? Because there are times when they want the control room to become a studio for a smaller control room. So the, literally the console goes down. But we took advantage of this cavity um, uh, to provide treatment. Um, that's not the first time we've done that. So we did take advantage of it. Okay. Let me see if I can. There we go. So that's the third generation mod fractal. By the time this project came into our, uh, our office, we now essentially became a full frequency prediction, uh, full frequency predictive software. Again, as I said, this started out as a low frequency analysis tool. In fact, for a while it was called LFA, low frequency analysis, because that was a, seemed to be the most difficult and, and I believe still is the most difficult part of any acoustical prediction uh, moment in a, in, a, in a small room. Um, but now uh, it is a full frequency tool for us. And you can see some of the, the printouts that come from the software. So each one of these treatments respond to a particular, usually, and we use resonators most of the time. Why do we use resonant Helmholtz resonators, HR? They're more or less the easiest for us to build. Um, they're not particularly difficult. They're pretty easy to calculate. Um, it's kind of hard to mess them up. Um, they, they look kind of nice. Uh, if you don't like the way they look, they're easy to cover. There are other tools that we can use. Um, we could use membrane absorbers. They're much more difficult to make, um, a little harder to predict. Uh, we haven't given up on that. Um, and um, we have a few other, other elements uh, up our sleeves in development. What we tend to not use are big, deep, what traditionally have been called base traps. Um, it's really not the way of the world, and it's particularly not the way of the world with small rooms. Um, if you start to think about absorbing 60 hertz or 80, 80 hertz for the, in a relatively narrow uh, bandwidth because the software tells you that that's what we need to do. Making a four foot or a five foot deep trap is not, first of all, we don't have five feet. And second of all, it's going to be very, very broad. It's going to be very, very wide. Um, it's also going to, at the same time, while you, with only moderate success, absorb low frequencies, you're also going to absorb a lot of high frequencies. Room just gets deader and deader and deader. And that's really not our goal. And you can see the results. Uh, com again, comparison between measurement and simulation, quite good. Um, and again, the temporal decay. So the studio is only a few months old. Actually, first client was Jack Antonoff, who's also a friend and a client, and um, thought it was one of the best rooms he had, he had worked in. So we were, we were pretty happy with this. And again, the T30 measurement versus simulation. Very accurate. And I thought it might be nice to end with, with an LA studio, which is Spotify's new facilities, um, quite large. Um, they are not a commercial recording studio, so any studio owners here don't, don't, don't be thinking in those directions. They use this for their own internal uh, content producing or whatever. Um, they're heavily invested into podcasting rooms. This is it's down in the Arts District at Mateo. And um, they, they installed 16 podcasting rooms, including one celebrity podcasting room, which is really set up to be a recording studio. 
Um, um, and that's, that's what that looks like. And then, of course, the, um, there, are, there are many wings to, they have their corporate offices there and whatnot. We're not really showing you that. Um, but the recording studios are in this wing here, including a, um, an echo chamber, which is actually kind of cool. And there's a blow up of Studio A. Uh, here, we were able to use an IRO in the very, very beginning of the design, and we had lots and lots of height. So we were able to optimize this, this height, both in its actual average height and in its slope. Okay, we were able to, uh, we had quite a bit of play as far as width and speaker position. Um, so very, this was a, a really good, a good use of the Niro uh, software, particularly for the geometric optimization. And a view of the control room. That's the smaller control room B. Again, everything ear level monitoring, of course. Soffit mounted, no SBIR, and the studios. Um, Niro really does, is not, doesn't really have too much to do um, with studio design. Ready Acoustics as a company, um, we sometimes get involved in some of the, some of the uh, reverb time calculations in the studio. I just thought I'd show you the slide. So anyway, that's our, that's our presentation. It's really only the beginning. We, there's um, six of us full time, um, kind of split our time between, I'll stop sharing, and um, we split our time between uh, dealing with real projects. Most of the projects come to the Niro team from WSDG. It's a sort of, uh, uh, it's not a division of WSDG, but uh, we're, we're its prime user, but we're not the only acoustician using it now, actually. Kind of interesting. We have about a half a dozen other acousticians using this software um, or using our service. And then um, we spend the other 50% of our time on pure research. Oralization is in our crosshairs. I would say, Peter, we're almost there. Actually, we are there. We're just not 100% confident with it. Um, we're also trying to develop, uh, we're, we still haven't give up, given up on membrane absorbers, variable membrane absorbers, and we're always on the lookout for thin absorbers. Most of our resonators are four to six inches thick. That's okay, but as an architect and a designer, I'm always on the lookout for something that's two inches thick or one inch thick. Um, and as our slide said there before I signed off, it, this is only the beginning. Um, let me go back on to that share screen. I'll just put that on there really quick. Okay. Um, you can read more about what we're doing at our website. Uh, if you want, we can provide you with a sample report if you want to see what that looks like. And of course, we're pretty happy to get into any kind of conversation or dialogue with anybody about this. Um, we're not a big, we're not Bell Labs, just six of us. Um, but we are pretty passionate about this and um, dedicated full time to to this this effort. All right. So okay, let's jump into um, Q and A. Uh, unfortunately, the person who asked the first question had to go deal with some flooding and thanked you profusely in the chat before he jumped off. Uh, back, uh, I should have inter interrupted a little closer about thirty minutes ago, uh, but the question was. Uh, I'd always heard that the intraoral time difference is on average 10 microseconds. Does the IACC change this? Hmm. Peter, you got to unmute. Yeah. yeah. That's what the I, IACC deals with. The IACC deals with um, <clears throat> the difference in level. Uh, between the arrival time at each year. Uh, and it was determined by Manfred Schroeder uh, many years ago that the, the degree of spaciousness that we, um, that we experience is due to the difference in the, it's called binaural dissimilarity. It's, it's due to the difference in uh, information that we get to each year. Uh, and that is, that is determined by not only the level difference, 
but also by the uh, by the uh, the uh, diffraction that our outer ear introduces the heavy related transfer functions. So it's all that's really what the that's really what the uh, sense of spaciousness is due to the binaural dissimilarity. Got it. I'm going to request to use that uh, input questions to the Q&A function. That makes it very easy for us to see. I did see a hand raised a moment ago. I'll try to accommodate hand raises if people prefer to speak. Uh, but let's add another question in or feel free to, to bring them in. Uh, here it goes uh, from Mr. Uh, Eric Winnicor. Can you imagine ever having a light version of Nairo, maybe with limited capabilities or only <laughs> most critical? <laughs> yeah, very good, very good question. <clears throat> very good question. And the answer, the answer, the simple answer is yes. Um, and you're not the first person that's asked for it. Um, I'd say that the question we're asked more than anything is, where can we get this software? Can we buy this software? And the answer right now is no, we're, we're not, we really don't want to be a software company. It's brings on a whole nother research company. So right now we, we have a tool. It does not have a front end, doesn't have a GUI. Um, uh, it's it, inputting the data is, is, is messy. Um, like, you know, sometimes we don't have the admittance. We have to go estimate it, play with it, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all of the characteristics of a company that does not want to make software. Having said that, um, a light version is something that we do, we do think about. For instance, maybe just the geometric version. But even then, it would, it would take some doing to figure out how all the information would get inputted, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there are some geometric optimization tools out there. REW has one, but most of those are rectangular rooms. And I don't, they're not really using, uh, you know, they're not really using BEM to come up with the calculations. But the short answer is yes. Uh, while we're waiting for others, um, I'll throw a question out. Did you, have you by any chance taken any of your, without necessarily naming a facility, any really strong facilities from the past that you've been really, really proud of, run them through Niro, and based on what you've learned today, would you, if you could do it all over, would, have you done any major facilities that you would go back and do differently? I think you're still muted. You're muted, John. <clears throat> yes, I think we have. Um, we have about 100 reports out. I think, right, Peter? It's that kind of number. Yeah, roughly. It's about 100. Now, not every project gets built. Uh, many projects are being built. About 10 or 15 are built. Some are built and we don't have measurements for. Some are built and we have funky measurements. We didn't use a head or you know so sometimes we can't get back into a studio it's it's not a perfect world out there but yes we did we it's called reverse engineering is what you're is what you're asking yeah we did do some reverse engineering on one or two projects yeah yeah if you think about it that first test that we did was essentially we reverse engineered we took a room that we knew didn't sound good and modeled it and then took a measurement. So that was really the first thing we did. But yes, we did. We have done that. Uh, we have another question from uh, Pedro Villas. Uh, is Nairo capable of predicting how a membrane like the RPG Modex plate reacts? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, um, we, the reason is we can measure the... <clears throat> When I designed the the, the Modex yeah. uh, unit, uh, we measured in the impedance tube, so we we know exactly what the complex impedance is. So yes, we don't need Niro to measure that. We we already have that information. Yeah. yeah, we can we can put that into into the Niro program and see its effect. If that was the question, <clears throat> any any acoustical material that we can measure or predict the, the admittance 
uh, we can evaluate its, its effectiveness. Okay, here's another one from uh, Alex Kurninakov, uh, where the first ratio that you mentioned, and you might want to read this in the Q&A yourself, uh, where the first ratio mentioned one to one, one to four, one to nine, uh, where did that come from? And oh, that's an old, that's a pretty issue. That's a well known. There, there are several people that have worked on these dimensional ratios. Loudon, uh, I forget Loudon's first name, that was one of his favorite ratios. Uh, the BBC has done some work with those. Um, um, uh, and there are some other there are some other researchers that have focused on. The I believe the one one four one nine is from Loudon. It was his number. It was his top. It was his number one. It was the number one ratio. Yeah. And we have used it on more than one occasion, and it is a good ratio. But it's not a good ratio if you put if you don't don't sit in the right place. I can tell you that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is from Vincent King about uh, materials. How are you efficiently gathering admittance ratings for boundary materials in, in Niro? Example, concrete wall formulations or foam and fabric. Um, they kind of reference that interior designers have libraries. Can a client send you a catalog of materials and add to a library? Well, if, if it's a treatment, we can measure it. So a, fab a fabric treatment, we can measure it. In, in in our impedance tubes. But uh, boundary surfaces are something that we alluded to earlier. Um, I think this, this person is, I think you're confusing two different things here. The admittance of a boundary, think of it as its stiffness, that's hard to measure. Um, so we're taking, I wouldn't say guesses, but we're taking really, really good guesses. And then we've done, for instance, as Peter said, at WSDG, we, we, use, we often use the same uh, wall boundary. Not always, but often. So we're pretty familiar with what that admittance is. Uh, what are we using? We're using a very low number. It's not zero, but it's pretty low. Yeah. Um, we have a project now that's, that we would need to know the admittance of the wall, and it's two feet of concrete. Well, that's basically zero. Although we probably won't use zero because math doesn't really like zeros. Um, that's not to be confused with a, with a material. Most people who make materials, they, they just gonna give us absorption coefficients and they do it in a rev chamber. And that's useful, but not useful enough for us. However, if we get a two foot by two foot sample, we can measure it. I briefly alluded to uh, <clears throat> the fact that you know absorption coefficients for materials are in the back of everyone's book. <laughs> Everyone uh, has them, but there are no admittance uh, values available, and uh, there is a a portable uh, impedance tool that BNK makes that we're trying to use uh, to. Um, in, in a research project to determine the admittance of, of many different types of boundaries. And that is, if anyone listening wants to do a research project, um, uh, give me a call, uh, because that is one of the most important uh, research projects uh, for the work that we're doing that I can think of. Now, for the novice uh, of acousticians among us, could you give a quick explanation of the difference between Admittance and absorption coefficient. The absorption coefficient <clears throat> is determined from the from the complex. The complex impedance is the reciprocal of the admittance, and the absorption coefficient is related to one plus the uh, one plus the complex impedance divided by one minus the complex impedance. So the absorption coefficient is derived from the impedance, um, and the, the beauty of the impedance is that it's a complex number. And it has a real part and an imaginary part. And the real part uh, determines how much, uh, how much resistance the material uh, provides uh, to the sound wave. And um, if you normalize that impedance, when, when the real part of the impedance is one, the absorption coefficient is one. And uh, if you have a resonator, um, uh, the, at the resonance of the resonator, the reactance, the imaginary part, 
has to go through zero. So when the reactance goes through zero at that frequency, if the real part is equal to one, then the absorption coefficient of that resonator is 100%. And that's what, that's what you strive for. That's why the impedance is so important, because if you have a device and the real part is greater than one, you know there's too much uh, interference. If it's less than one, uh, material is, is too porous. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, does Nairo need to calculate geometry as well in order to determine a best result, or is it able to calculate the best speaker position and listening position and treatment based on a, a basic square room, uh, like a living room or a, a bedroom? No, that is the that is the first step. That's what, that's that first, that slide where it looked like the geometry was jiggling around. That mm -hmm. is the geometric optimization moment. That that is the first step. Yeah. Is Maybe there a square? The better foot question limit? is what happens if you can't change the geometry? And for a while, some of our designers thought, well, we don't need the geometric module. And the answer is no, we do need the geometric model. We're going to go through it anyway. We're just not varying the dimensions. But there's you there's usually something you can do, even if it's just moving the speaker position a little bit or the listening position, but that is the first thing we do. Uh, there's a, another part to that question about, uh, I'll say square foot or extended to cubic feet. Is there a limit to how small a room can be before Niro is, mm -hmm. um, is effective? That's an interesting, now that is an interesting Or question. large. Well, we, we, limit, we limit it right now. It, it's really no limit. It's just a question of how long the FEM is going to take yeah. to, to run. We're, we're, we're roughly limiting it to 200 cubic meters. The, the problem with the small room, as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, all of the reflections come in at the same time. There's really, there's really no place to move to optimize either the listening position or the loudspeaker. Yeah. And but we have done, you know, small rooms. It's hard to put a number. Well, on. we we mo we mostly do small rooms. I mean, well, it depends on the definition of small. Yeah. But I think Peter is right. There would be a moment when it's not that you can't run it through Niro. It just wouldn't do anything. Um. It would be like, you know, uh, well, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, What's the smallest tire you could put on your Tesla? I mean, there's, I, I guess you could put any size tire sooner or later, but there's going to be a moment when it doesn't, it simply doesn't make any sense anymore. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, a domain within, <clears throat> within which you're varying all of the parameters. And when the yeah. room gets to a certain point, there's just no, there's nothing no to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other, the other really important point is that you have to do that, the geometry and the, position of the listener and the speaker at the same time, because you can vary the geometry, um, but then, and then there is one particular location, you know, that is appropriate for the listening position. As the geometry changes, all of the other parameters change. So they have to be done simultaneously. Even if the room is cuboid, uh, you can vary the length of width and the height. You, in other words, you don't have to rely on uh, dimensional ratios. You can come up with an actual length, width, and height that is appropriate for the uh, location. We, yeah, we we have rooms where we where there is no possibility to change the geometry. The room the room exists. Yeah. So the only thing we can change is speaker position or listening position, transducer position. Okay, it's worth the effort. It would be better if we could change the geometry, but we can't. We have a number of rooms like that. We're we're fortunate. We're designers, so we get a lot of projects that are not built. They don't exist. So we try to not box ourselves in. That's remember we I, I think I discussed that it's a kind of an interesting moment because in order to in order to move a project from the design board to Niro, we have to have something to input. We so we have to start with a room. So how do we start with the room? It, for WSDG, we start with a client, we start with a program, we start with a budget, we start with a space, and sometimes you, you know, you 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 go down a road and you sort of get locked in. But we try to leave ourselves some flexibility, so that when it finally does go to the geometric model, the first phase of the Niro process, we are at least able to 
allow Niro to have some flexibility with geometry, the, the boundaries, uh, in addition to speaker position and listener position. So uh, another as far question. As the largest one, I, I guess it's just computer power, right, Peter? I mean, that's yeah. really no yes. there. It's just computer power. Um, yeah. uh, so here's a new question. From your experience, do you adapt a project to the client's monitor system or suggest the optimal monitors for the best result you calculated? Depends on depends on the client. Um, the from from our point of view, the, the the two most important elements that we need to that we need to understand from an equipment point of view is speakers and consoles. Now, why console? Because console usually drives where somebody sits. Um, it can be the largest object in the room. And once we know the console, we kind of know the recording chain and that usually has, that affects all kinds of other things that are not involved in the Niro process. Um, some clients, some projects start off and they know exactly what monitor they want. They, 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 they know what monitor they want before they even know what address they want. Okay, and then other, projects, they're looking for our recommendation. There's no shortage of great monitors. Um, they, and we're familiar with all of them, or most of them. We're much more interested in the position of the monitor um, rather than the actual specific monitor. But we have a lot of data on monitors. Um, the queue of the monitor is interesting, et cetera, et cetera. So, What's more interesting is the conversation that might center around subs. That's a whole nother hour, we, 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 which we don't have. Um, we do a lot of uh, multi-sub uh, installations now, not for 5.1.4, not for immersive specs, but to um, we use the subs now as essentially acoustic tools to squash some of the modes. At Mix with the Masters, there are hidden subs that are there just for acoustic reasons. They're not part of the immersive system. Would you find that implementing Niro into your design and project workflow, is it saving you time, increasing you time, or giving you better decision-making within the allotted time? Well, it's definitely C, which is why we started it. We always had an LFA or low frequency analysis time slot. We, in other words, we always, we always got to a certain point, and then we started looking at LFA. We were using intuition. We were using modal spreadsheets, which I think Peter has pretty much shown everybody why you can throw most of those away. Kind of negates the first 30 years of my life, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and, and we were also using ABEC and one or two other software tools. So this came about as simply a way to replace LFA. So it hasn't really added any more time. Um, it, it changes a little bit about how we work in our office. In other words, we, we're designing and then it goes over to the Niro team, but it always went to a Niro team. It was just called the LFA team. And um, uh, so it hasn't really taken any more time. And it absolutely has made for a better, well, there's, it's the only reason we're doing it. It's it's an infinitely better product, as I think we've we, well we've tried to show, but it hasn't really taken any more time. Cool. We've got two more questions in queue, and that's probably going to be a logical uh, logical conclusion, unless you want. That's to an interesting question, though, because I'm not sure if I've ever heard that question mm -hmm. being asked. Um, well, we know time is money and the quality of output for the time that you spend is, is important. Um, and the, the engineers are always looking at workflow to get good results and or better results in fixed time or more results in fewer time. So I mean, it's one of the reasons, it's one of the reasons why we took this analysis out of our design company, because as a design company, we weren't really set up as a research company. I mean, research, you have to have broad shoulders. You have to be prepared to go into a dark hole. Um, you need some funding. So we set it up as a separate company. We got separate funding for it. It's kind of sits over on the side. It, it, it has the pressure of 
surviving, but it doesn't, doesn't have a lot of pressure. Um, so when it's time for our design project to stop and go into the Niro uh, uh, ch chest of activities, it, it does that with a fixed time and a fixed, and a fixed cost. So as far as our designing is concerned, as far as our clients are concerned, this is an invisible process. Now, having said that, some of our clients actually want to see the reports. All these reports um, of which you're seeing pieces of, and by the way, you can get a sample report if you're interested, just go to our website. I would say half of our clients, they, they, they don't care. They, they're not really interested. They just want to know it works. So, um, but it is an interesting question. <laughs> Uh, so our two closing questions uh, related to uh, to monitoring and speakers. Uh, question number one, if only near field monitors are used, do any of the calculations become less important? <coughs> Same process, mm -hmm. I think. <clears throat> we have projects where we only have near field monitors. Yeah. And then the related question is Niro work as a stereo speaker system or with any type of loudspeaker configuration? Any. Any. Yeah, any. And now we had to expand. I mean, for a while we were just calculating for sweet spot mixed position. Mm -hmm. Now we have moved away from that and have several positions. Uh, in our home theater work, we have about a half a dozen positions that we'll calculate for, and then we'll average them out or discuss them, et cetera, et cetera, so. Yeah. Well, on behalf of our international audience tonight, <laughs> I'd like to thank both of you uh, profusely for your time and generosity. Uh, I think you did an awesome job of uh, explaining what you did because this was a relatively focused batch of questions, but I see a lot of people that I know, you know are, are, are critical users of rooms. Uh, a lot of people that I know uh, that are, are also doing uh, doing designing and such. And for those of you in our audience, we also greatly appreciate the time you spent with us tonight. Uh, please join us again on the 24th. That will be an open, uh, open forum as opposed to a webinar for studio management. And as always, uh, at Audio Engine uh, ASLA, you know, our goal is to, uh, to encourage conversations, encourage networking and communication. Uh, there's plenty of uh, no shortage of great comments in the uh, in the chat. So, uh, Greg, definitely. thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. And to everybody that's listening, I can't. Fifty-two people. I can't believe everybody stayed up. Although in LA, it's <laughs> we were only, up to six. Yeah, we were up to sixty-four a while. Uh, it's eleven thirty here on the East Coast, <clears throat> so it's dark here. But um, uh, thank you, and um, please stay in touch. We're this is. This is new stuff for us, so, so we're. Um, it's easy to we're easy to find. You can go to Ready Acoustics, or you can just type in my name or Peter's name. We're very easy to reach, and if anybody's got thoughts, ideas, um, maybe there is another impede this tube in the United States that we don't know about, but <laughs> probably not. Um, but please stay in touch. Thank you very thank much. You both, thank, thank you me. both very much, guys. Thank you. Good night. Well, the invitation is out, the challenge is out, and uh, good uh -oh. morning in Mumbai.